Um, thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. This is the uh, Crystal Minnesota Environmental Quality Commission. And we have um, Amber Burnett from the Science Museum of Minnesota here to talk about bird feeding. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Amber talk and we'll be quiet. Okay, um, I almost feel like I'm stealing somebody's thunder by welcoming people tonight since you let me go first. Um, does the, the screen look okay? Can everyone see the presentation? Yes, it looks yes. fabulous. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, thank you so much. This really is a, a, a joy to be able to um, uh, spend this evening with you. Um, I, I am a staff at the Science Museum. I've been there almost four years. It's the coolest job I've ever had. If you haven't been to the Science Museum, I really invite you to come out. We're open Wednesdays through Sunday. Uh, next week is MEA, I believe. So that might be a really great time if you haven't been there before and bring a young friend or, or two. Um, we have the ultimate dinos exhibit actually coming back. It was at the museum a number of years ago and it was on the road and we didn't have a booking so we actually brought it back to St. Paul. So I invite you and dinos is actually a really nice lead into birds which I'm so excited <laughs> wanted to talk about tonight. Um, the Science Museum really supports people on their journeys to discover uh, new things, educate themselves and so I'm thrilled you wanted to talk about this particular subject which is something that's really dear uh, and, and dear to my heart. And um, I think birds are the best teachers, by the way, um, better than any people are. So I, I think this will be a great opportunity to learn not only about what you can do for birds, but in a way they'll kind of help us help ourselves. So um, with that, uh, yes, birds need all the help they can get. Um, that's probably true. You've read a lot of articles recently about kind of the plight of species, um, but populations in general. So now let's take a look at what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, the topic is winter bird feeding, and I'm going to say that I'm couching it as bird feeding in Minnesota. Certainly if we lived in other states, we would have a, a little bit different discussion, but um, uh, this, is, this is how we're going to frame it a little bit tonight. So the first topic is why feed? That's pretty, uh, generally won't spend a ton of time on it, but will birds starve if I go on vacation? Uh, you would be surprised how many people actually ask me that. So we're gonna <laughs> dig in. Um, feeders to use, uh, gosh, we could do an entire weekend class on all the feeders that are out there. So we'll, what we'll do is cover some of the basic designs that are out there. And what we'll do is we chose those because uh, there are certain birds that I, th I think you should reasonably be able to attract to your feeders. So we're going to set you up for success by looking at the birds we think will come and match it up with the feeders that they do prefer. And actually a really important point on this and, and maybe the most important is how to clean and maintain your feeders, which is, which is really great. You guys like a clean table. Um, and so birds do this the same way. Uh, bird seed. Yep. We'll go over some of the, the kind of general ones and some good ones. And I actually, actually really want to spend time on the last one. Uh, I uh, personally support uh, the city that I live in is the uh, support the mayor's monarch pledge that she did earlier this year. And what it basically is, is encouraging people to plant natives or perennials in their gardens. It won't actually do a lot for this coming winter, but it'll help birds in winters to come and actually year round because a lot of the things that birds will eat, other pollinators and insects will. So it's actually a really good idea to have this kind of a diversity in, in your yard. So why feed? Well, if you do spend some time in Minnesota or, you know, live in Minnesota as most of us do, uh, it, gets, it, it, it gets where a lot of our resources are gone uh, in, in that time of year. So this having feeders, having um, plants that we'll talk about, you know, have seeds that birds can pick at during the winter, this is a great way for them to get a nice little boost of energy um, and you know, again, it's, it's not, it's, well, it's going to be something that's really going to help them out, especially with some of those brutal and cold winters. Birds that are here in the winter really just need to get through the night and get to the next day. They're not really storing a lot of fat because they're not traveling. They're not migrating. If they're here, they're going to be here. And the next one, will birds starve if I go on vacation? So two things to this. The first one is the graphic that I chose for this. Uh, again, we could use an entire weekend to talk about why the bird feeders you put out aren't necessarily guaranteeing that only birds are what you're going to feed. And anything that does tell you that it's squirrel proof is probably leading you into a false sense of security because squirrels, I think, kind of consider that a challenge. And even if it takes a 
few months to a year, they will figure things out. There are some things that you can do to kind of curb it a little bit. But, you know, again, we live in Minnesota. We want to get out of Minnesota for a, a, a little bit of time sometimes in the winter. So will birds starve if I go on vacation? No, the short answer is they will not. So birds that are in our state at that time of year have evolved to not rely on just one food source, whether it's somebody's yard uh, or, you know, the, the plants that someone else has. So what they're going to do is basically think about each day and the, the routes they take to feed as return on investments. So if your yard has pretty consistent feeders, you'll probably see the same birds uh, over and over again. If you are gone for a week, the birds will pr probably take your yard out of their route because stopping in and seeing this empty feeder over and over again means I wasted the energy and, and I really don't want to do that. I want to conserve it. So when you come back and you start filling your feeders again, I do get also the question, all my birds are gone. What happened? They all died. No, it's the birds are going to take a little bit to kind of put your, your yard back on the route because since they took it out, they aren't going to be checking as often. And so it'll take them a little bit, but fear not, they, they probably are going to, somebody will happen on it and they will be back. So you can certainly go to Florida and enjoy and don't feel bad. Your birds will come back. So let's talk a little bit, and probably most of you know these. Uh, these are just a few of the birds that we can expect to come to our feeders in Minnesota. Some birds actually don't come to feeders at all. So I'll, I'll talk about them in terms of one bird at the top, a middle row, and a bottom row. So the bird at the top, not, not everyone recognizes. They're, it's actually the American goldfinch. Uh, in the wintertime, they actually sport a, a pretty muted or drab plumage. This is the bird that's a bright snappy yellow in the spring and summer. They will do what's called a molt, so their feathers are replaced from the bright to the kind of dull, and they will still be at your feeders in the wintertime, and then they will molt in the spring and get that kind of great kind of lemon drop yellow color. In the middle row, we have uh, downy woodpeckers. We have several woodpeckers that are actually in Minnesota. The black-capped chickadee is kind of a common and, and certainly a favorite in the middle. Uh, and then the other one in that middle row is called a white-breasted nuthatch. That's a bird that actually, um, you kind of hear it before you see it a lot of times. They sound like they're complaining. <laughs> So you hear that before you see them a lot of times before they come into your feeder. Uh, the bottom row, the male cardinal, certainly a lot of you recognize that bird. Uh, the females are kind of a maize or a, a little more of a yellow color. And the last two are actually my favorites. So I am a huge lover of the brown birds, which are the sparrows. So the middle one is actually a bird that will breed in uh, much further north than Minnesota. It's actually the American and tree sparrow. So they actually will come into Minnesota because it's much more temperate and it's actually kind of like a club med for them. If they stayed where they bred, <laughs> they wouldn't survive. So the American tree sparrow, and then the other one is called the slate colored junco or the dark eyed junco. And they're actually called the snowbirds. So again, they will come to Minnesota as kind of a vacation spot because where they normally would or where they would breed is too harsh a conditions for them to survive. So much like some of your friends might go to Texas for the winter and are called the snowbirds, the slate colored juncos are actually the true snowbirds where they come into Minnesota for the winter time. So let's talk in general about some feeder designs. And again, there are so many different ones out there. I chose just a few to talk about um, so we can get a sense of what the range is. So the top, let's say there's top two. Uh, kind of the first one is they're called a suet log. So the woodpeckers in particular, but nuthatches and chickadees really do like suet. And you can buy suet cages, which are mostly green, kind of a plastic or a metal mesh. And you can buy a suet cake. We'll talk about that in a second. But these logs are fantastic. You can buy suet that is shaped already in a little log. You just do a little insert into where it's kind of a hollowed out little hole. Or it's almost like Play-Doh and you can kind of shape it and make a little ball and, and stick it in there. And birds absolutely love this. Um, so I, I highly encourage if you have a, a space to hang these, these are fantastic. Fantastic. The next one is called a tray feeder. So birds like the cardinals and the sparrows, actually, if you watch them, they don't spend a lot of time perching on the types of feeders that your chickadees and your goldfinches do. 
Uh, their foot shape is a little bit different. And so these tray feeders are absolutely crucial if you'd like those types of birds there. They will spend a lot of time on the ground and they'll eat spilled seed, but in the winter time, obviously that can go away pretty quick. They will scratch a little bit in the snow, but if you can get them up out of the snow on this kind of hanging feeder, uh, the platform feeder, that's fantastic. The next one is kind of a, a really good general design, the mixed seed that everyone can find probably. And then you have kind of a, a, you know, a baffle on top and then something that's kind of encircling it that again will discourage squirrels, but they will still find a way somehow. It, it seems like that always is the case, but this is an opportunity. Um, it also is somewhat of a uh, protection. Uh, again, it doesn't guarantee when you put out a feeder who you're going to feed. So hawks are around mm -hmm. and they need to eat too. Um, this helps sometimes. Birds do generally get out of the way when they know one's coming, but it actually does give them a little bit of protection when they're at the feeder too. Um, the last couple, the one that's kind of in the middle is uh, like a tray feeder, but you can set it on the ground. It doesn't, it just has some feet, so it gets up a little ways. And then it's got kind of a little roof to it which is nice if you know it's gonna snow a little bit, it'll kind of keep the seed dry. And the last one is again, a pretty general design. It's uh, actually got suet cake holders on both sides. It, um, you can hang it, it's got a little roof. Usually you put sunflower seeds in it and there's like a baffle on the bottom. So that's again, kind of a, a good standard uh, solid one. So now let's talk about a really important companion piece to having um, feeders, and that's to make sure that you clean and maintain them. So obviously, if anything's broken, repair it. Um, cleaning is so important. I, I know so many people ask me, Jeepers, I've started to notice some of the birds at my feeders have, you know, kind of crusty eyes or their, um, their eyes look closed. And it's a lot of times something's called conjunctivitis, which means that when you have a communal situation and really dirty feeders, it is um, something where birds do get sick. So I really encourage you occasionally because it's snowing and it's wet and it's thawing and it's freezing to take your feeders in and clean them with a solution of water and, and a really weak bleach. Uh, solution. And, and that will really make a difference. Um, again, we like a clean table when we eat and birds are the same. Uh, the other thing I do, uh, the picture here are, they're actually uh, boot trays and I'll put my feeders over boot trays. Cause a lot of times if the seed uh, is going to be uh, kicked out, then I can take the boot tray up and it'll take some of the seeds um, and, and you can take that inside because come spring, you're going to have kind of a mess underneath. And, you know, again, that's kind of nice to have that cleaned up for birds. So now let's talk about some of the seed mixes. Um, yes, you can have a bad seed mix. And in a lot of cases, it's filler, which is kind of like bad food for you. It's kind of bad food for birds, which means they probably won't eat it. It'll cause a mess. And it's, you know, you're wasting money in essence. A good seed mix is, you know, something like what you see here. I, I like ones that have like a crack, corn, um, some peanuts, some sunflower seeds, um, you know, some other, sometimes there's mixed fruit in there, but something that offers a little bit for everybody. They are a little more expensive sometimes, but really the birds are going to eat all of it instead of leave so much of the filler. So think about something like that. And bird stores, we have lots of great ones here in the cities. They can make great recommendations for you. Uh, black oilers are the sunflower seed that have, um, most of the time they have pretty thin shells, they're easy to crack. The kernels have a high fat content, but you do tend to get more shells on the ground. The striped have a thicker shell, but you're probably not, like cardinals will be able to get in there, but not all of the other birds will. So just be aware, you're going to make a, a trade-off depending on which one you would, you would choose. Um, peanuts and cracked corn, uh, often you can get both of these in a good mix, so you don't have to buy them separately. Um, the peanuts, I do want to just caution, unsalted is, is the way to go. You don't want salted peanuts. Um, that's, that's not good for birds. Cracked corn often, again, is in a little bit of a seed mix, and sometimes sunflower seeds or safflower seeds you can find in there. Suet, yes. I Really, you can't have too much suet in the winter time. Um, if you do notice uh, that birds aren't coming to it readily, you also can, you know, a whole cake, you can, you can break it in two. So you can kind of see um, how, how much or how frequent your traffic is in coming to your feeders. 
And if they don't eat it right away, then you're not wasting um, all of your suet right at once. But you can see there's one, uh, a hairy woodpecker is at the suet log and then a chickadee is kind of at the suet cake feeder that you see a lot. Uh, Niger or thistle seed, um, it's important to remember that these are uh, heat sterilized. So the seed that will fall on the ground is actually not going to sprout in your garden. But this is a sock feeder. Um, goldfinches will be on this a lot, but you can get feeders. They just, the seeds are so small, you need something that'll have a, a smaller um, hole for the birds to get the seed so the whole thing doesn't just dump on the ground. So here's something that I kind of referenced at the beginning of the talk, which is, don't forget about what you can do in your yard that will feed birds in the winter, but it, it's uh, something you probably won't be able to do right now, but do it over time. So I'm a huge fan of um, winterberry, sumac, uh, dogwoods, any of the arborvitaes or the cedars. Um, I, I think these are really great shrubs. Uh, if you have the space, I, I just can't tell you how much these are so important. Often they will offer cover as well. So they're kind of a, a double wonderful thing. And in the spring, they're going to bloom, you know, so then you'll have something to attract insects, which will be great for pollinators, not just birds. And birds are pollinators too. Um, and, you know, here's a, boy, seeds and, and um, you know, other grasses. I am such a huge fan. I've got a lot of Joe Pye and uh, the coneflower or echinacea in my yard. Um, I grew up in South Dakota, so the blue stem, little blue stem, big blue stem are huge. And this is a favorite picture of mine in the middle where it's kind of a little bit of everything. And those are, if you have the space, boy, I can't tell you enough. And, and truly more and more cities have um, accepted that this is actually a healthy part of your landscape. Grasses a lot of times have, and especially if they're natives, they have great root systems. So they're actually gonna help you with soil, keeping soil in place. You're gonna water less because these plants are all used to our, our lots of water, not a lot of water. And so they're really good for you in addition to the birds. So I really strongly encourage you to think about this when you're making your bird feeding plans. So I think we did pretty good uh, on time. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer some if you wanted to make that part of your program. Can, we do, can I ask a question? Oh, sure. So, yeah. Um, like for instance, um, so I'm a big fan of wrens and uh, I have a wren house every year. Great. But, uh, lately I have a downy woodpecker that has taken over the wren house. So it's <laughs> made the hole bigger and it, it's, you know, so is it, you know, it sounds like it's going to overwinter in the red house, right? Well, um, so uh, so downy woodpeckers are here in the winter, uh, house wrens are not. So that is correct that you are going to get a coming and going of the guard. Uh, they, um, as far as a, a roost, they may not use it every night. Um, and if you truly didn't want them in there, you can buy, there are, it's like a metal, you know, like a washer almost. Right. So you could keep a hole from getting any bigger. And that's what a lot of people will do. So they have a chickadee house or a rent house and they don't want it to be made bigger. Um, so you certainly can buy something like that. The other thing is you can just take it down if you'd rather not have them there. You know, I'm not, I'm not discouraged by it. I mean, I think it's kind of neat that it has chosen to use the rent house. Double duty. Uh, sure. yeah. My understanding is, is that like the male wren will have like a pretty large territory and then he'll basically have, uh, you know, he'll have houses all over the places and uh, try to have well, families, right? So oh. in, in the spring, when birds are going to think about families, woodpeckers probably aren't going to use houses. Woodpeckers actually will make their own cavity in a tree. So really, it, nobody's kicking anybody out because the wrens are gone. They wouldn't use it anyway. So the woodpecker coming and going is not booting anybody out. And in the spring, uh, when wrens come back, the woodpecker is probably not using the house anymore for any reason. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah that's cool. Do we have questions from anyone on the on the Zoom call? I see a Barbara and Floyd and a Paul. Well, this has been very interesting. I I can't think of any questions though. It's very, ooh, and then you see my clock, but not me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> table. No, it's just interesting. Questions. Have, oh. Yeah. oh. 
So Paul wants to know, can you comment on cracked versus whole kernel corn? Um, sure. So cracked is probably going to be more accessible to more birds. Um, whole corn is very attractive to squirrels. And I actually have several friends who, rather than fight the fight, they just make a pile of corn that is for the squirrels. And they kind of will go right to that. And then the cracked corn in a, like a seed mix, you know, the, the other birds will actually go towards. So you, you can, you can somehow find a way to call a truce or figure out some, some, you know, workable solution in your yard sometimes. But for birds, do birds prefer the cracked corn? Is that more accessible to them? Yeah, um, most birds are not able to um, um, consume something quite so big. I mean, blue jays could, um, okay. whole kernels probably could, but sparrows and chickadees probably wouldn't be able to do much with the, the whole kernels. So crack corn is, is you know, already you've, you've gotten through the shell and you can get to it and the pieces are much smaller. So they're a little more accessible to, to more birds. All right, interesting. Um, any questions in the room? Yeah. Um, so I've been converting my front yard to 100% native plants. Great. And um, I'm, I guess I'm wondering if, you know, you did list some things, uh, some of which I have already and some of which I don't. And I guess I'm just wondering if you could name a few, maybe like three of the best. Sure. So top I'll, three. Like a top some, three. Yeah. There's some birds. really amazing resources out there. I, I actually love living in Minnesota because there's a lot of great um, state, federal, you know, and other agencies that are really trying to help people out and answer these kinds of questions. So one of the really great um, resources that I always recommend to people is our, our Minnesota DNR um, website. There is a and a whole suite of pages and information that actually will not only give you suggestions of plants, and obviously they'll be the appropriate ones for our growing zone, but it'll also break down and give you um, some ideas of how to uh, plan your garden with here's what to put in there for shade, for wet, for full sun. And so it kind of takes some of the guessing out for you. So you can actually use some, uh, you know, be the benefit of information that some of those folks have already put together for you. And they'll give you great lists of the plants that, that are great for birds. What they're thinking about is in an annual cycle or in the 12 month period, it's great to have things that'll bloom or offer fruit or seed spring, summer, and fall. And then of course, in the winter time, um, I, well, I, I leave things up. I don't cut anything back in the fall because so many plants that they stick out of the wind, out of the snow will actually let birds perch, give them an opportunity to perch out of the snow, and then they'll pick at the seeds throughout the whole winter time. Um, and so it's, it's thinking about how to plan your garden to offer something to birds and pollinators kind of throughout the, the most of the, the 12 month period as you can. Another great one is the Minnesota University of Minnesota Extension Office. They have some really great um, resources there too. I actually, and, and many of you might have as well, the, the Master Gardener course. Um, I didn't keep up with my volunteer hours, so I can't consider myself a Master Gardener, but there are fantastic um, resources there. And the Bee Lab is actually there. And so there are very specific resources if bees and pollinators are really what you're kind of thinking about. So um, you have a, a treasure trove of things at your fingertips, actually. All right. Any other questions from folks on the phone or folks on the Zoom call? Well, thank you uh, for what you do for your city. You are um, definitely what, what you do makes a difference. So thank you so much for being interested in this topic and uh, have a wonderful evening. Hope to see you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.